And we're back here, segueing into the second part of the podcast, episode two, part two here. Uh, Going to talk about the MHSAA state championship games. Uh, last week, we had Brett on as a guest, uh, and we did some picks for each one of the games there. Uh, obviously, we just talked about how Brett is now an official co-host, and we should mention before we get going here that Brett won. A little round of applause here, Brett. El Brett campeon! Won. El Brett campeon! Won. The picks, uh, Brett went, what, seven and three with the Michigan State and Michigan picks as well. Uh, and I was one yard away from tying. Boo. One yard. If DeWitt Famous won that game, words. I would have tied Michigan was Brett. a call away from beating Michigan State. <laughs> uh, yeah, game of inches. We all know that. But anyway, so there was, Brett, some, sca- there was some scandal in that DeWitt game we can talk about later, too. We'll, we'll get to that game a little bit later. But just wanted to mention Brett is the winner. He beat Corey and I, and uh, he beat Kurt Richardson, who t- uh, chimed in his, his, uh, his picks on Twitter. So nice job, Brett. Corey and I, in a couple weekends here, will be buying you a growler of Onyx Edge Black IPA from Brickhaven Brewing Company in the beautiful city of Grand Ledge, Michigan. All right. So we're going to go ahead and get started here. We have Brett uh, on now as a co-host, and we're going to go through all these games with our guest here, Tate Baker from the D-Zone. Tate is on uh, to give us some insight and some valued opinion. He uh, spends his time working with the D-Zone covering Michigan high school football. Uh, and uh, yeah, Tate, welcome on. How you doing, man? Good. Thanks for having me. I'm excited to come on and talk some high school football. You don't, you don't talk enough high school football, right? You don't, you don't spend any time looking at high school football, do you? You know, I feel like uh, the majority of time I'm uh, talking to people that probably don't want to hear it as much as I'm, uh, <laughs> as much as my enthusiasm <laughs> kind of takes over. But I'm uh, happy to to share this platform with some some guys that actually you know know the game and uh, are ex- as excited uh, as I, as I am to talk about it. Yeah, we we actually care about it, man. We we love it. We're we're all about it. You can you can tell us everything you want, man. Uh, so we are going to start in reverse order here. We will start with the Division Eight game. The the uh, even games were played on Friday, and the odd games were played on Saturday. Uh, but we're going to just go in order uh, of the divisions. Uh, so we do have Division Eight first up. Division eight was Hudson beat Beale city 14 to seven. Uh, all three of us, Brett, Corey, and I picked Hudson to win this game. Uh, Hudson, uh, if you are not aware at one time made national news back in the 1970s, they have the longest win streak in the state history. Uh, they won 72 straight games from 1968. Is that longer than Ithaca? It's longer than Ithaca by three games, 1968 to 1975. 72. The impressive thing was, is they weren't even playing playoffs until that final season because 1975 playoffs started that year and they went to the state championship the first year they were played. And that was what ended their streak. They lost in a state championship game in 1975. So yeah, it was Hudson's first and only second first state championship game since 2010 second school history, uh, 114 to seven Tate. Do you have any, any thoughts on this game here? Obviously D eight, uh, you know, not as exciting as the D one game, but. Yeah, so it's you know that D eight game starts at ten o'clock, which is you know D eight. Got to be thankful for the opportunity to play in Ford Field. That's got to be rough playing at ten a.m. Um, I actually thought that you know Beale City looked like they were the better team in that first half, but um, Hudson's running back uh, Nick Coppin kind of just warmed down and I think he broke one hundred and thirty yards and he had two scores, and that was pretty much you know the determining factor there, but. You know, it was, it was a solid D8 game to get the weekend started. Yeah, and like like we mentioned, uh, and I kind of talked about it when we previewed this game, is, you know, both of these teams, and we're going to talk about this again in the second here with the D7 one, um, very defensive-oriented, and we obviously saw that with the final score, 14-7. to seven. Hudson gave up 99 points on the year, and 40 of them came in two games. So wow. very impressive defense. Very, if very Beale City, defense. if Beale City leans on their quarterback, who looked like the biggest person on the field, I feel like Beale City kills them. I mean, it didn't even look like a game. Yeah, both yeah, teams like, were very uh, much load the backfield, under center, run heavy offenses. It seemed like Beale City had more of like a, a diverse um, offensive game plan. There, they had a wide yep. out that you know made some plays. Uh, Carter Fussman was his name, but you know. I, I think that they had their chances, but, you know, at the end of the day, that ground and pound and, you know, like you said, that defense kind of made the difference for them. 
yeah, holding the team to seven points in the state championship, uh, which uh, only one other team, two other teams, I guess, did over the course of the weekend. So pretty impressive performance there from Hudson. Congratulations to Hudson on their second state championship. All right, we're going to move on here. Let's get to the D7 game. Uh, You were speaking about 10 a.m. state championship games. Uh, My dad and I, and actually Brett, our fellow co-host here, Brett, his dad, Mike Johnson, the three of us went to the Palama Westvalia Lawton game at 10 a.m. at Ford Field on Saturday. Uh, is the I've been going to the state championship games with my dad um, and sometimes my brother and Brett and Brett's dad uh, for well over a decade since 2008. This is the first time we've ever made the 10 a.m. game. Never done it before, but I was really excited to watch a local team and Corey's laughing at me, a local team in PW uh, play. Jeremy Miller has had a hell of a career there at Palm Westphalia uh, in nine seasons, and uh, he does it again. PW beats Lawton, a very, very good Lawton team, a Lawton team that was having their best season in school history. Beats them 14-10. to 10. They go 14-0 and 0 for the third time in six seasons, fourth title in school history. Tate, what do you think about this game, man? Uh, PW is injury riddled, too. They brought two of their best players back off of injury for this game. Oh, the thing that um, I think the number one thing that stood out to me about this game was the the por- performance of Troy Troy Wortman. Um, he was a running back, linebacker, and punter. He had six punts for two hundred and thirty two yards. He averaged just under forty yards a punt. And that's really game good. like that, that's uh, I mean, when you can punt for forty yards a pop and and a small D seven game like that, that's going to make all the difference in the world. Flipping the field position like that and. I think, um, you know, another defensive battle and he kind of made some other plays on on the offensive side of the ball that, you know, helped Poamo kind of pull through there. Absolutely. And I, speaking of defensive battles, going off of Hudson here, PW also 98 points given up on the season. Very, very impressive. 42 of them coming in playoff games to powerhouses, New Lothrop and St. Francis. So another incredibly stingy defense here uh, in terms of these small schools. I don't know about you, Tate, but something that stood out to me, because, again, I watched this entire game live. Um, I was very fascinated by the fact that both these teams came out with loaded backfields. PW came out uh, in power eye, uh, under center, you know, pro formation, and Lawton came out in a straight T, um, mm-hmm. and then they went away from it. Both of them, PW in the second half, went to a spread offense, Lawton started going to a spread offense. I, I was kind of surprised by that. I know PW, I've, I've watched PW. I know they do that, but it was it was just kind of funny the difference between the D8 game and this game to watch two teams where they're, you know, loaded backfield, 30 personnel offenses weren't really getting it done how they wanted. So they just went to a spread. I mean, PW is going empty backfield more than once, uh, five wide. I thought that was kind of interesting yeah, to see you, in a D7 game. You definitely don't see, um, at least at that level, uh, program that has the ability to to play both styles and and do it well I mean I guess it wasn't as effective it was only 24 points uh were scored in total but to even to have successful plays in both of those packages you know says a lot about the the strength of those both of those programs yeah you gotta hand it to him man happy for Jeremy Miller gotta be happy for Lawton too man again best season in school history um yeah so that was the D7 uh, game you guys how about PW? yeah I think it's PW, like the biggest athletic powerhouse in the state. I feel like oh, they're in the state finals kids. every single year for football and basketball, especially being in public school. It's pretty impressive. I guess that's what happens when you're playing with all your cousins and your brothers. <laughs> uh, Lawton's Jake Roof, 49 rushing touchdowns, leads the nation um, in rushing touchdowns in high school. Pretty yeah, crazy. you told me that earlier. That's incredible. 49 in a season. That's very impressive. Derek Henry that's a, stats. <laughs> that's almost that 50. <laughs> incredible. That, no, that is very Beating the nation, that's that's crazy. At any division, that's wow. incredible, man. That's very, very impressive stuff. Uh, you mentioned, Brett, state championships. This is Puam Westphalia's sixth state – I can't talk. Sixth state title appearance in 10 years. Yeah. I'm well, telling since you, 2011, they made six appearances and they've won four. Two runner-ups, four state titles, so – have those all been in D7 or are they fluctuated a little bit? They have been D7 every year. Okay. Every year. Yeah. So their enrollment holds pretty ste- steadily, has held pretty steadily uh, to 290 to about 330. So 
hasn't fluctuated a ton for him, but yeah, sure. very, very impressive job by Puan Westphalia. All right, gentlemen, unless you have anything else to add, we're going to keep going here, move on to the D6 state championship. Uh, I believe all three of us also picked Puan Westphalia. We all, for our picks, said PW would pull it out. Uh, D6, another local school for Mid Michigan. For, you know, again, Brett, Corey, and I are all from the Lansing area. So Lansing Catholic is in their state title this year in the D6 uh, game, and they played Warren Michigan Collegiate. It was their first title appearance ever. Uh, this was Lansing Catholic's fifth appearance, uh, I believe, in school history, and their third win. Uh, they won 16-6. to Tate, what did you think about the Lansing Catholic game here? <laughs> this was, I think, the drunkest game of the weekend. <laughs> it, <laughs> it, it was... It was the sloppiest, um, just it was bad I did, I did brains of football one. at times, but also the most entertaining of football at times. Um, Warren Michigan Collegiate, they just have some athletes, man. You can tell that yeah, they uh, they're kind of like the leftovers that don't really get the first pick of the litter at De La Salle and uh, Brother Rice <laughs> and all those schools. So yeah. they find a nice <laughs> amen to that. But Warren Michigan Collegiate, <laughs> but no, the um, their offense was like jackpot pretty much and they had a wide out uh Trayvon Redding that would just go up and out vertical the rest of the yeah defense he was impressive multiple occasions and would bail them out it was it was an interesting way to go about it but they they kept the game close and what Lansing Catholic was just a better structured team and it was only a matter of time before they kind of put that one away but it was entertaining sloppy and everything you want in a d6 game yeah, and I think it's worth noting that Michigan Collegiate is a charter school, uh, and charter schools first started opening in Michigan, um, you know, early in the 2000s. So this was actually uh, their only 13th or 14th season in school history. Uh, they're a very new program, Michigan Collegiate. Um, so first state title appearance for them. Uh, I, I wasn't sure. I, I can't remember when I was watching the game if they mentioned if it's been the same coach the whole time. Um, I'm not sure if you're aware, Tate, or not, if, if it's the same. So I coach. guess I guess um, the Jeff at the D zone was telling me that their offensive their, now their offensive coordinator. Uh, he used to be their head coach, but he's had some health issues. Yes, uh, so they talked about that on TV. That's right. So he's kind of slid into like a more of an advisor role, but he's still the OC. Um, yep. According to according to the guys at the D zone, this was, in their opinion, the least talented team that they've had in about like five to six years and just so happened to be the one team that kind of broke through and got to the state championship. Hmm. So it's kind of funny how those things kind of work out sometimes, you know? Yeah. All they, about matchups. Yep. Yeah. They had a weird schedule this year because they won a game on a forfeit uh, that was a no contest. Didn't even get played. They lost a game to Chandler park, but were awarded the win on a forfeit. I have not looked into any news stories as to what Chandler park did to forfeit that game. Uh, they lost pretty handily to Detroit Country Day. Uh, they lost to Milan as well, so they could have been six and three. They finished seven two, but they could have been six and three. But yeah, it just seems like they just got on a roll. They beat a red hot Michigan Center team in the semifinals by one touchdown. So it just seems like it was their year. They just they they got things rolling. Yeah, yeah, they had an abundance of athletes. That's for sure. Yeah, I, I, mean, I was going to say, penalties. luckily. Luckily, LCC sees a ton of talent because they play pretty much all the best teams in mid-Michigan every year. They played PW. They played Portland. They played Williamston. Yeah, when we previewed I mean, this game last week, and that was one thing that all three of us uh, – no, excuse me, Corey picked Michigan Collegiate. Uh, Brett and I picked – Brett and I picked Lansing Catholic. and that It was, was close. Well, one of my reasonings for picking Lansing Catholic was their schedule. Um, I mean, they play Waverly, who's not very good, but Waverly is Division three, three divisions higher. And Waverly, even though they're not very good, has much bigger kids, more athletic kids than Lansing Catholic. They beat a talented Williamston team, a talented Portland team and a last second field goal. They lost by five at PW. So to me, Lansing Catholic had a very impressive schedule. Battle tested. Yeah, absolutely. All right, let's move on to the D5 game here then. Uh, we previewed this game last week, and I believe unanimously picked Grand Rapids Catholic Central. Uh, unbelievable run here. Uh, I mentioned the word dynasty last week, and Brett kind of affirmed it. was like, yeah, let's refer to this school as a dynasty in high school football. Grand Rapids Catholic Central beats Marine City 31-7. to Tate, I'm sure you got some 
some beams to so, spell on this team, man. The talent on this team is unbelievable. Man. Yeah, no, I mean, Nolan Ziegler, in my opinion, um, is probably top five player uh, in the state all year. He just showed once again that he's just too much of a match for, you know, anything that comes his way in D5. He led the way of seven catches for 136 yards and two touchdowns. And then on the defensive side of the ball, um, he had 13 tackles. So I'm hoping uh, maybe Harbaugh gets in his ear that now now that Brian Kelly left for the Bayou, they would <laughs> swing him towards Ann Arbor. But who knows? Um, but no, I, I think Catholic Central's won. It's got to be close to 40 straight games now. Speaking of that record, I know it's in the high 30s. Um uh, their quarterback, John Passanol, uh, you know, he stepped in for Joey Silveri, who went out with a torn ACL, I think, the third week of the season. And, you know, that offense just – they didn't miss a beat ever since um, that injury occurred. And they they didn't put up as many points uh, as I expected them to. I mean, 31 still, but, you know, that whole game they're in control and really kind of led the way with their defense as well. They played a talented Marine City, man. That, that Marine City team – uh, that was the most points Marine City had given up all year. Uh, previously, the most points that Marine City had given up was 14 in the regional championship. Um, if you don't include the state championship game, they gave up 118 points on the year. So stingy defense from a Marine City program that's very talented. Uh, Grand Rapids, as we previewed this game last week, Grand Rapids Catholic Central, hell of a run they're having right now. But Marine City, man, uh, if you look at their history, also incredible, incredible, incredible. Since 1990, missed the playoffs three times and wow. won four or five state titles. So Marine City is also a very impressive program. Uh, I'll affirm affirm your stats here, uh, Tate. 37 straight wins for Grand Rapids Catholic Central. 37 straight. They have won three straight state championships, five and six years, seventh title in school history, and their fourth undefeated season. Dynasty, unreal. Five and zero oh in the last six, though. Not just gone to five; they've won five of the five, No, yeah, five out of six state championships. Unbelievable. That's and, crazy. And the year, the year that they didn't win it was in 2018. They lost by two points in the semifinals to Edwardsburg. They were actually up a division. They played Division Four that year. <laughs> not, not okay. to mention that GRCC probably has the coolest venue to watch a football game in West Michigan, maybe next to Rockford. There's really? stadiums. A lot of Catholics, very, lot of Catholics there. Nice. I've never been there. Never been there before. In the art. It's brand new. It's it's nice. It's really nice. It looks hot from the highway. That's about all I see. So. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> well, all right, guys. Uh, I think we're going to move on here to probably one of the most exciting games in Michigan high school state championship history. Maybe games period let alone state finals absolutely one of the most exciting state finals um and that is the division four state title between chelsea and hudsonville unity christian now when we previewed this game last week we <laughs> unanimously picked hudsonville unity christian i think rightfully so man going into this game hudsonville unity christian uh was was 24 or 25 points away from setting the state record for points in a season they not only set the record in the game this weekend, they became the first team in Michigan high school history to score 800 points in a season, uh, which is absolutely un unbelievable. 803 points. Now, their defense had done pretty well throughout the year. They had never given up more than 22, uh, but their defense and turnovers eventually cost them the game. They ended up losing to Chelsea 55 to 52 on a last second field goal after leading 45 to 17 in the third quarter. Uh, I watched this entire game live. I almost turned it off, but I'm like, you know what? For the podcast, for Great Lake State football, I got to watch this whole thing, be ready to go. And I'm glad I didn't turn it off because I saw an instant classic. Tate, what are your instant thoughts and takeaways from this game, man? Yes. I was trying to think of a crazier game that I can recall. And I don't know if you guys remember, it was me, me and Tom Smith were at the game, our, our buddy of ours. Um, it was East Grand Rapids, Orchard Lake, St. Mary. Oh, yeah. Yes. But I think Robert I was Bolden was a freshman quarterback for Orchard Lake, St. Mary's. He went to Penn State. I remember watching that game. I think I was at, at that game, too. So that was like what, eight, that was like an eight overtime game. Um, mm -hmm. Something like that. Something crazy like that. So, I remember in the 
I think it was like midway through the third quarter of the, the Unity Christian game on Friday. I started working on other things, just getting ready for the next game, whatnot, just because, you know, the game was a lock. And um, my coworker asked me, he's like, why is Unity Christian no longer going for two? I was like, oh, yes, like, you know, I know the games are wrapped. So they started kicking uh, extra points. Goals. Yeah, they started kicking extra points and they they took out the Chandler twin and put him at like wide receiver. So I don't know if it was like a strategic thing or if he got banged up or something, but they took him out at, at QB and put in like a, a quarter, another quarterback who turned the ball over and they just started doing a bunch of like just weird stuff. Yeah, I panicked. Yeah, well, I think I thought the game was a wrap too. And then I think they got comfortable. Then, they got com- yeah, they when it got was forty. So it was. So I this whole game I watched live, and you're right, Tate. They went their first four touchdowns of the game. They went for two. It was thirty-two uh, to fourteen, and then just before halftime, Chelsea kicks a field goal with less than a minute left to make it thirty-two seventeen. And even the announcers were like, "Well, I guess this keeps it to fifteen points, two score game." And they're like, oh, this half, this half's almost over. And with less than a minute, they scored again uh, before mm-hmm. halftime. And they made it 38 to 17. And then they went for two and didn't get it. It was the only two-point conversion they didn't get. Still a 21-point lead. They came out and scored in less than 60 seconds after the half and kicked an extra point. Yeah. When they had gotten four or five in the first half, I didn't understand that. You could go up 46 to 17, right? And you right. have a 29-point lead. And then they ended up scoring again. <laughs> And imagine if you're up 54, right? 54 uh, to it would have been 54 to 31 at that time. I think it would have been as uh, Chelsea started coming back. But yeah, I I, I agree with you, man. I don't understand that decision to stop going for two. Um, Very weird. Was it three straight turnovers? Yeah. Three straight turnovers. Like in a row. Last two and a half minutes. Three straight turnovers. And man. You deserve those. You you mentioned that. Turnovers killed him. I thought that that Chelsea field goal was a sad field goal at the time. I was like, you got to put up. It won them the game. Up, you got to put up six points to keep <laughs> up this team. And the announcer like, said that. The announcers on TV go, oh, you got to go for six against this team. <laughs> yeah, and it, it turned out to be a huge factor in it. And um, so I was up at the press press level, uh, you know, doing uh, highlights and, and updates on that game. And immediately following that game, um, that's the last game of the evening. So there's – there's um, interviews on the field opposed to in the tunnel. And I have never been so happy for a team. And so sad at the for same team. time, just so <laughs> devastated. I've never seen a group of kids just look so completely just defeated and shocked. Like they're not going to forget that for the rest of their lives. I no, know. never. Both teams. That's, both teams will. No, no one's. Know. None of them are going to forget that. It's unbelievable. That's, Gosh, I just I don't know how you blow that lead, and I don't know how you can manage to come back from that in a state championship. Of and what's games. what's also crazy is that I don't know if you could see it from up there, Tate, but on the replay from the field, if Unity Christian rushes that field goal at all, they block it. He it was muffs a bad, the it was he a bad mu- it was a good snap, snap. The muffs snap, the, muff know, the snap. Like it. He what? It. I did the, not give see the that. kid credit. Give yeah. the holder credit. He dropped it and very quickly, incredibly quick hands. The kid who kicked it kicked it, it from a flat. He kicked it with a flat foot. I swear to God, he ran to the ball, stopped, and then kicked it. It was unbelievable. And it, it was like not a gimme. It was like a thirty-six yarder too. or something too. It was like yeah, thirty-some yarder. Man. You know, one of the other fun facts of that game, and I was watching it. It was one of the, the few games I was able to watch live. Um, I think it was the third quarter, maybe fourth quarter, and it was like fourth and five, and Unity Christian lines up to punt, and that was their first punt, first punt that they were the season. Season, the entire season, <laughs> and then he, he faked it. He faked it. He <laughs> ran for a first down. I remember hearing that. I was like, oh, they got a punt. They don't know what to do, and he runs for the first down, and then they ended up having to punt again, so they had one punt their entire season. Then they ended up punting, yeah, later Crazy. on. Crazy. Yeah, I mean, they. I don't think they had a close game all year. They they beat every team. I want to say by at least thirty. So oh, they crushed everybody. So not, I guess maybe not having that. They averaged of, Tate. They averaged over fifty points a game. They averaged almost fifty one points a game. Yeah. Uh, I, was, I mean, to, to not at least have a little bit of adversity in your season at all, I can you know that kind of might come back to bite you in a game like that where you're just shell shocked where the you have the momentum pretty much all season and then even all game that, they had it through almost three quarters of that game yeah all all game and and then when 
a team like Chelsea that's got, you know, athletes across the board. They got a running back that's that's been Trent Hill, know, just, man. He's talented. Yeah. His brother played at state, correct? Yeah, Nick Hill. Yeah, we Chelsea. played against him. Me, Brett, and Corey all played against him. Mm-hmm. Uh back in 2009. He uh, we used to scrimmage Chelsea. Uh, Grand Ledge scrimmage Chelsea in the preseason, and uh, we went down to what was it, um, South Lion, or where'd we go to? Scrimmage? We went to Chelsea, Chelsea that, we that year, Chelsea, yeah. yeah. And Nick Hill, yeah, he was their starting running back. Man. He used to be South Lion, Chelsea, De La Salle, and us. And Hazlitt, yep. Hazlitt was there too, I think. Oh, fuck Hazlitt. I will, <laughs> I will say that in that game, Unity Christian. Is there a better quarterback name than Cam Chandler? Like, what a cool sweet name. name. <laughs> hey, PW had a quarterback yeah. named Cam Cook. Got to shout out the last name there, baby. Yeah. <laughs> That's sweet. Boo <laughs> that effort. You're fired. I'm, but no, I'm man, Chelsea's, Chelsea's – <laughs> I was really impressed with the quarterback play on both sides. Chelsea's quarterback could sling it. I think he had six touchdowns on the day. The one and those wide Chandler had five of them. Dude, they yeah. set so many mm-hmm. records. Yeah, that's another thing we haven't talked about that. They set the record for touchdown passes in the game in the state title. They set the record for total points scored in a game in the state title. Uh, did they set the record for receiving touchdowns in a game too? They set a quite sure. a few records. I'm sure he did. The Chelsea wide receiver's knee was like falling off too. He'd like he'd catch like a 60 yard bomb, score a touchdown, and then limp off holding his knee. Like, <laughs> Dude, stop. Like just come off, own it at this point. <laughs> I think it's also worth noting. I mean, as devastated as, as like Tate said, he felt, and I, I felt devastated for those kids too at Huntsville Unit Christian. You got to be happy for Chelsea, man. Uh, oh, it's yeah. been the same coach at Chelsea for a long time. I think his name is Josh Jacobs, I believe. Um, he's been there for a while and he's taken Chelsea now to uh, this is their fourth state championship he's taken them to, and they've come up short every time. They lost to River Rouge in the semifinals last year, the River Rouge in the semifinals the year before. Edwardsburg crushed them in the state championship in 2018. Uh, they got beat by Orchard Lake St. Mary's in the D3 state championship in 2015. Um, and then he took them, I think, to maybe one other semifinal in there somewhere. But finally, finally, in one of the most incredible games ever, gets Chelsea their first state championship in school history. Got to be happy for those kids and that coach, man. Pretty cool. It's all, it's always good to see the public school beat the private school. <laughs> Brett, Brett over here talking about that like crazy, man. He loves it. <laughs> I'm on board with that, Brett. <laughs> all right. Thank do you, you guys want to add anything else in this game? Otherwise, we'll move on to the top three, the three big dogs. Although D4, uh, pretty amazing game, but we're going to move on, I think, through D3 and up here. All right, D3, another local school in DeWitt from the mid-Michigan area, defending Division Three state, state champs, beat River Rouge, who was the defending state champs from 2019 last year, uh, returns to the state championship this year. Um, DeWitt, to me, had an even more impressive offense this year. Uh, their biggest problem, to me, coming into this game was their defense. Their defense in 12 games last year only gave up 80 points. Uh, they shut out uh, more than half the teams they played last year. They shut out about seven or eight teams. Incredible defense last year. They lost a lot of linebackers and D linemen from that talented defense last year, uh, but they lost almost no one from their offense. Their offense is even better. Uh, I mentioned this in the preview last week. This is the most points scored by a Rob Zimmerman team. Rob Zimmerman has only had one team in his tenure score over 500 points. This team scored 635. So the best also, offense he has had. It's also the most points DC Vince Cook has given up in his career. No, <laughs> I gave up more to them last year. Oh, well, <laughs> improvement. Yeah. Uh, I don't want to say that we gave up 50 and a half, but we're going to move on from that. Anyway, uh, <laughs> I, I was worried about DeWitt's defense coming to this game, but it was their defense that kept them in it as the final score was a loss to Detroit Martin Luther King, 25, 21. Uh, the most amazing moment of the night was DeWitt going for it on fourth and goal, which I don't blame them. They didn't really have a choice in the waning minutes from the one yard line of King and coming up short. All they had to do is punch mm-hmm. it in from one yard out and they win the state championship because at that point there was probably not much time left. Although I don't know, King is pretty explosive. So maybe they figure out a way to win the game with a minute or two left, but pretty unlikely at that point. Tate, what do you think, man? This is yeah, was, this was an exciting game. I was hoping 
in that um, they're going to get across that goal line there. I really wanted to see uh, Dante Moore with the ball in his hands with desperation mode. Um, yeah. But it just wasn't meant to be. Um, that was probably the most anticipated of the of the eight finals, I would say, from, a I guess, an even playing field standpoint. And of the fact that, you know, Dante Moore's uh, maybe number three or number four overall prospect in the 2023 class. And then with the wit, you know, you got – um, both of their wide out and quarterback are going to be going D one. Um, but yeah, and I, they have another kid ex- going D one that, uh, Flegler is Flegler going to air force or debris. Uh, one of them's I'm going to po- air force. I'm not positive. I know McIntosh is going to Wisconsin and then mm-hmm. their quarterback's going to Brown. Correct. Yep. Yep. I think it's yep. Flegler's going to air force. Okay. So yeah, like, yeah, a lot of, a lot of D one talent across the board. Um, I was expecting more points to be honest, but I was you know, too. Um, their defenses, you know, kind of you could tell that both defensive coordinators had game plans to kind of neutralize what the other team wanted to do. Um, I was a little surprised of some of Holt's uh, maybe mistakes that he made in the second half. He had one like uncharacteristic turnover, um, but he, you know he made up for it on the defensive side and. Jeez. And that, uh, interception return what a return. what a weird stat. I mentioned this to Corey and Brett going into this mm-hmm. podcast. I have never seen, I mean, I don't you guys correct me if I'm wrong. If you're listening to this podcast, tweet me, text me, message me. Has anyone ever seen a quarterback in a game throw a pick six and then turn around on defense and pick six the opposing quarterback? That would only happen in high school events. I've never seen that. Up. No, I'm just saying. I'm just saying. <laughs> I'm no. It could happen in D two or D three football. I've seen guys play both ways in D two or D three football. But you're right. More likely in high school. Your but, starting quarterback. There was no D two quarterback in the country that starts on defense. I'm. I'm aware it's unlikely. I'm aware it's unlikely. Okay. All right. Okay. Uh, I'm. I'm just being facetious. I'm being a little. You know, exaggerating. I got you. Come on. I got you. High school football, it's more likely. But have you ever seen it regardless? Oh, uh, not not uh, maybe not uh, an interception, but not on not of a you no know, a game like that where so much is on the line and against that type of team. No, he he definitely made made up for that mistake right away. But yeah, I mean the two pick sixes were like a wash, and then like you mentioned, both these teams just couldn't get their offenses going. Um, I mean, I, I was kind of surprised the Zimmerman ran the ball as much as he did he did have quite Mm -hmm. the running offense but king has an unreal d line and linebacking core those kids are huge i thought he would let his athletes uh, in the passing game with holtz and mcintosh and flegler and debris kind of let things open up a bit a few times they did but they didn't really stick with it as much i was kind of surprised maybe he just he thought he was going to run it down their throat i don't know but seemed to be a a common theme with both of the the losing teams in d2 and d3 i think they kind of got away with what they um, were really good at, but we can kind of go into D2 later, obviously. What's terrifying is that King is going to be better next year. Dante Moore is a junior, man. Yep. And they have three other top. Wait till we get to D1 and we talk about Belleville's quarterback. (laughs) Wait till we get to D1 and talk about Belleville's quarterback. All right. Do you guys have anything else to add D3? Otherwise we'll jump into the final two divisions here. Let's do it. I still say coach. I still say Zim's gone. He's leaving. We can, we'll talk. We can, we can wrap this up with maybe a little postseason talk a little bit here. Uh, all right. D2. Uh, another one. I, Tate, you can correct me if I'm wrong, but I think going into this game for D2, probably another very, in my opinion, highly anticipated matchup with Traverse City Central and De La Salle. Um, I believe we unanimously picked De, or, uh, Traverse City Central. I guess I should mention uh, that we had, we had a two to one pick for the last game. Brett and Corey both picked uh, King, and I picked Dewitt. And like I mentioned, I came up one yard short of winning that one. Uh, but this one, we unanimously picked Traverse City Central. Traverse City Central is having their best season since they won the state championship back in 1988. Uh, it's their first ten or more win season since then, and uh, they lost. Ironically, lost to Dewitt pretty handily. Got beat pretty handily the first game of the year in the Big House. Ann Arbor. And after that, they ended up scoring more points than DeWitt. They went off for 649 points the rest of the season uh, or 620 something points the rest of the season. Uh, Granted, they don't play quite as tough a competition, uh, although they did play Brother Rice in a non-conference game and they beat a red hot Caledonia game in the regional championship. 
Uh, 41 to zero in the second half before they put in two touchdowns late for a final yeah. score of 41 to 14 against powerhouse Catholic Catholic central league, De La Salle Tate thoughts on this one, man. Yeah, definitely did not, uh, see the lopsided score coming. Um, De La Salle, man, they, they just got some beefy boys on that defensive line and their linebackers were outstanding. Um, and I, I want to say, uh, I was expecting Traverse City to try to get the ball out uh, to their playmakers more. Their wideout, Carson Bardot, was one of the most elusive uh, slot slash, you know, smaller end of the wideouts uh, that I've seen this year. Really can make guys miss. And they did not complete a single pass, I believe, in that one. Zero play. yards. <laughs> I think they were 0 for 9. Um, so passing? I guess I didn't catch that. Yeah, zero yards I, passing. Zero yards passing. And – you know, that wasn't that wasn't, um, I guess, their style of play throughout the year. They incorporated the pass, not, you know, they weren't air raid or anything, but, you know, they I mean, they would incorporate, you know, quite a few screens and, you know, just short uh, check down routes. And that was just completely out of the game plan. And, um, you know, uh, Josh Burnham just could not get any running momentum whatsoever. They they were throwing two, three guys at him whenever he crossed the line of scrimmage. He just cannot get anything going and it's, you, you eliminate that from Trevor city central. And that's pretty much, you know, their bread and butter. And it just, they cut the, the head right off the snake. And it was, it was, it was ball game in like maybe the second quarter. It was crazy to me how much it was 35 zero at halftime. I think. Yeah. Or 34. It was crazy to me how much faster De La Salle looked on the field. I mean, it looked like they shouldn't even have been playing each other. De La Salle's all their athletes were literally just running by the TC kids. And it's like, okay, well, this was fun. Well, I'm going to harp it again. It's the private school and the public school. You got a public school in Northern Michigan and you got a private school in Metro Detroit. I'm actually kind of upset. I picked TCC in this one, but if you remember, if you listen back to our episode, I wavered, I wavered. I was very close and I regret it. I should have picked it. Tay had been to a, Tay had been to a, I know, I know Tay definitely went to the Caledonia TCC game where TCC dominated Caledonia and Caledonia was a good ball team this year. Yeah. And I just, I got a little bit on the hype train of Josh Burnham. I still think he's good. I mean, kids going to Notre Dame. Well, at least he was going to Notre Dame. Who knows now with Kelly leaving? But it's just a, an example of how football is a little bit different than basketball. In basketball, you can ride your your one guy all the way. But in football, if you shut their best player down, you know, there's not much you can do. I want to give a shout out to uh, the linebacker, uh, Will Beasley on De La Salle. I think he was – that was the best – uh, defense performance uh, I saw probably all weekend was just he was mm. he was flying around and he was definitely the, the spearhead of that defense he um, just eliminated anything and everything that Traverse City Central was hoping to get going just with his his play alone just captaining you know that that defense well and having a great running back against a uh, running quarterback who's as big as as uh, uh, <laughs> Traverse City Central's quarterback, it's what was a six foot four, 230 pounds. I mean, in high school football, man, you don't usually see quarterbacks like that. So, um, having a lot that of is, that see, flies you around, don't even man. see kids that like is, that, let alone that is, uh, that is Princeton commit. Will Beasley got some brains to go as with his uh athletic abilities as well. Brains with the brawn, that's how it goes, man. Well, all right, do you guys have any? El, anything else you want to add on this one? Otherwise, we'll finish off here with our final Division One state championship game. Dun, dun, dun. All Get right. We got Belleville in their first ever state title appearance. Uh, pretty cool. I feel like uh, recently we have had some rotating teams in the D1 game, which I, I always like to see some new teams get in there um, playing for the state championship game. So it was cool to see a team in Belleville who had never been there before um, and had come painstakingly close in several semifinal games, uh, including last year. Corey and I remember talking about this. Went for two against the West Bloomfield team that won it last year and mm-hmm. did not get it. Lost 35-34 in the semifinals last year. Came up short. Uh, were undefeated until that game. In 2019, were undefeated. Came up by three points to Brighton, who I believe won it that year. And uh, in 2018, lost by 12 to Chippewa Valley. Three straight semifinal appearances. Finally get there. They played Rochester Adams, 
who had not been to a state championship since 2003, their only other appearance. And back then they were a D2 school. So they won the D2 state championship in 2003. Uh, it's the same coach. I thought that was cool on on, T, on uh, uh, the big screen um, when I was at the game because I did watch this game live on Saturday. Uh, they mentioned that this coach has been there for more than 20 years. So it's the same coach who won it back in 2003, finally gets back to another state title. Uh, and it does not go his way in the second half. So the final of this one was Belleville, 55-33. to 33. Tate thoughts on this one. There's quite a few things we could talk about. With yeah. This one. Um, first off, Bryce Underwood, man, I think he's the most impressive freshman. Um, I've seen since, uh, who was it? Jay Rue. Jay Rue. Jay Rue. Jay Rue Campbell, former yeah, fair but, state bulldog. Yeah. We as long as he about doesn't body slam a security guard, you should be <laughs> having a, a better career. Hopefully. I hope so. Fingers yeah. crossed. He's very good at Ferris. So he was very good at Ferris. <laughs> Um, but yeah, Belleville, man, they just, it was, you know, the time was coming for them to finally break through and, and get, get a ring. And you could just get to tell this was a year. Um, so many athletes on that team and Rochester Adams, you know, they're in the fight for, for a good, good part of the game. And then just towards the, yeah, it was a one score game at halftime. Yeah. Towards the end of that, you know, third quarter, you could tell that it was just a different class of athletes on the other side of the ball. Um, Jer- Jeremiah Caldwell had a big day, only four, only caught four passes, but amassed 203 yards and, uh, and three touchdowns. <laughs> Jeez, so, oh, Pete. I mean, whenever you can do that, um, you know, that's, that's, uh, that's quality production, efficient production, I should say. Um, you know, Parker, uh, Picot, the, is that how you say it? Pico? I don't know if it's a French, uh, pronunciation or not, but yeah, Rochester so. Adams. <clears throat> Rochester Adams quarterback, he had a he had a, a good game. Um, you know, they run that. I don't. Is it a veer? It's a it's an interesting offense. It's like a. Yeah, it's I actually, unfortunately didn't get to watch that game. Yeah, it's it's uh it's it's what we run. It, we run a you know triple option offense. I I think it's unusual. I would be curious to know uh, why that coach has their wings, their slots line up in a stagger stance. I don't know if you noticed that Tate. Um, they they don't line up square. It's like a square. Scrimmage. Yeah, they line up in a stagger stance, almost like a sprinter stance, and they put their uh, in the pistol. The back behind the quarterback is in a three point, like a fullback. So, very I think interesting. I, it was very effective for them this year. Uh, I think it gives you. I think it gives you more lateral movement coming out of it. I'm sure. I'm sure their coach has a reason for doing hmm. it, and obviously it worked for them. They had a heck of a year. Quarterbacks only yeah, junior too, so they'll be back. And I believe I believe that quarterback is a Alabama baseball commit. So, hmm. um, holy shit! Just a weird tidbit there, but um, yeah, just a, a very strange, maybe not strange, but strange to me, an offense I've really never seen before. Um, and stylistically, is a, a fun, fun, entertaining D one game. Um, I do want to say, if the MHSA wants to get this right, yes, I know what you're gonna say. An easy fix to this: there's never good attendance at that game it's because the michigan ohio state game is on the exact same time slot put the d1 game on eight o'clock friday night you have people yes. going into ann arbor every other year for that game i guarantee you that lower bowl will be full near to full if that d1 game is on friday night at eight of course you can't count on mhsa to do anything that's you know seemingly that makes sense that makes sense that makes sense thing to do so that'll never happen but that seems like an easy fix to me we did hey, like my, my mom this up last week yeah i do want to I, I just wanted to touch on the attendance I, I was able to gather some numbers so the friday games there was eighteen thousand seven hundred eleven fans that attended throughout the day on saturday there was nineteen thousand eight hundred forty three so there was slightly more but to tate's point I think if you shift the time, the start time in that D1 game, you're going to add at least 5,000 more fans because, I mean, Belleville, Rochester, Adams, those are both local teams. A lot of people want to go see them play. It's always a good game in D1. Um, the MHSA has to get this right. And the thing is, a couple of years ago, I think it was like 10-ish years ago, Ohio State used to play Michigan the Saturday before Thanksgiving. So there was never a problem. And then when the Big Ten and FBS level expanded to 12 games, they then had to shift to the following weekend. So now it coincides with the D1 game. But I agree, Tay. It's probably a separate discussion. We could go on all day about it, but they need to get that right. 
I have Paul in the MHSA now. I'll pass the message up. Yeah. <laughs> Corey's mom works there. <laughs> My apologies to your mother. Yeah, it's <laughs> fine. But... She just she just manages the finances. It's fine. When did your mom start that job? I didn't know that. She is like the head of finance for the MHSA now, and she's been there for probably four okay, months. Tell months. her to tell Mark Ewell. She's technically or, an exec. Yeah, Mark Ewell. Tell oh. Mark Ewell. They got to fix the From D1 Vince. Time Vince, slot. Vince says you need to fix the D1 time slot. Vincent Cook. Listen to our podcast, Mark Ewell. Come on, Mark. Come on, help us out here. Give us some love, baby. We got, we got the D zone on here. We're talking about Michigan football. Come on, get us going, baby. All right. Yeah, I I, uh, I agree with you, Tate, man. And and Brett, I think, brought it up last weekend. I, I I think it's interesting, Brett, you brought up the attendance difference. I think it should be even more because if you think about it, all the bigger divisions are playing on Saturday. One, yeah. three, five, seven, opposed to two, six, eight, two, six, two, four, six, eight. So you're you're talking about every division technically is one higher than the even with the odds on Saturday. So you should have more attendance. Bigger tend to be bigger schools, but um, yeah, that's too bad with the Michigan, 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 Ohio State game. People are going to watch that game. I mean, they're going to go to it. You got a lot of Michigan fans in the state of Michigan, so come on. I think they should fix that. I think you're right, hundred percent. But who knows if they ever will? Probably not. Like Tate said, unlikely. <laughs> well, all right. Uh, any final thoughts coming out of this weekend? Otherwise, there's one other thing I thought we could ask Tate about, and we can wrap it up. I have I have one thing to touch on. Um, I'm just I'm really happy that for the players, especially the seniors this year, they're able to play out their season. I know there are some cancellations due to COVID, but me myself being able to play both my junior and senior seasons, those are some of the best memories I have in my athletic career. And I'm happy that those seniors were able to play out their season fully and the playoffs. Um, continued as usual. I think there was only one playoff game that was canceled due to COVID, and it was in the earlier rounds. So it was good to see those guys be able to finish out their careers strong. You know, again, I feel bad for the, the teams last year yeah, and the that players rough. that were seniors last year. You know, they I think the state finals were the first or second weekend of January last year. Yeah. So very weird. Yeah, but it was good to see them be able to finish strong. And I guess the MHSA did that right this year. I think it was a good – there was a lot of energy in the season too, which is good. I went to a handful of games. It felt like people were happy to be out. Um, the crowds were fairly big. I mean, I went to probably two or three Portland games. I went to a, a Waterford Mott game, and the crowd was packed, and it was like freezing cold out in the playoffs. So, mm-hmm. and yeah, I think I think communities rallied around it, and we just got to keep building because I think, Vince, you've touched on this before. Um, numbers on football teams are declining pretty rapidly. So – they got to do something to our get boy kids Tony in. Anise, who we've been hyping up, man. He gave a hell of a speech at the uh, MHFC MHSFCA Coaches Clinic at the Lansing Center uh, in January of 2019, and he pleaded with college coaches uh, or high school coaches um, about the declining numbers across the country, rapid, rapidly declining numbers in high school football, and how this game could vanish if we don't save it so sad sad stuff how it, it went to uh the numbers the statistics he showed was something like 15 or 14 million kids playing back in 2007 2008 uh to 2019 or 2018 and 10 years was all the way down to like uh eight or nine million so it had <laughs> almost lost 10 million kids in uh in like a decade so crazy Crazy man. Uh, I, I saw an article came out of the west side of the state. I can't remember the news outlet which which uh, news station it was uh, that also touched on this. How in in just the state of Michigan, how many thousands of kids we have declined in football in the last ten years? It was something like fourteen thousand in ten years. Uh, we had declined in numbers in just this state. Um, and they said the biggest reason, not concussions. They said concussions is not the reason. They said concussions uh, only occurred two percent of all college or all high school football players had concussions in the state of Michigan. Two percent this year. Uh, they said the biggest reason: specialization in sports. Specialization in sports uh, between travel basketball, uh, travel lacrosse, 
a- baseball, AAU, travel baseball, baseball. Track. Now you have seven on seven tournaments in the winter for football. Uh, and kids are now quitting uh, sports and specializing in one sport. They don't think they should be dual or triple sport athletes anymore. And it's killing. Uh, you're a better killing. athlete when you play multiple sports and you don't get burnt yep. out. But that's, that's the other phenomenon. The article brought up uh, kids who are playing baseball year round are experiencing Tommy John's earlier than ever. They said kids who are playing basketball year round are getting shin splints and knee problems more than ever. Uh, so they said kids specializing are experiencing medical problems because they are, they're getting burned out. It's creating issues mm-hmm. for them. So yeah, I, I, I hope it's something that can be corrected soon. I think it's an information thing. It's a knowledge yep. and information thing, just informing people like, mm-hmm. hey, college coaches are not expecting you to. A lot of it, I think, is kids think that college coaches want them to do it. And it's like, no, they, they, they want good. you to play more sports. They want to see how good of an athlete you are. Yeah, I was say they want the best players. It doesn't give a shit what you do. Just well be the best. <laughs> Brett, Brett and Tate could talk about this, man. One of, two, one of their best friends who is a good friend of mine as well, Dan. Uh, Don Hummel, Robbie's younger mm-hmm. brother who played at Grand Valley, Robbie Hummel, uh, who played at Purdue. His brother Dan had never played football before. A I drunken told this story, never drunk, played football before. I'll tell the story again. Yep. So, our, our buddy Dan, good athlete, good roots in his family. Um, summer before his senior year at Valparaiso High School, he got drunk with his buddies and his buddies are like, no way you can make it through the football season. No way. And Dan was just solely a basketball player at the time. He goes, seriously? Oh, I can do it. I can do it. Next morning, woke up and like, you know, you're, you know, you told us you'd play football this year. He thought about it. And he's like, all right, I'll go out. And Dan went out and had a hell of a season. I think he beat Jeff Samarja's record in touchdowns that year. Came close the former Notre Dame player and played in the MLB had a short stint in the NFL too. But anyways, played one year high school football, gathered a couple of scholarship offers, both D one and D two ended up going to grand Valley, but it's just, that's an example of you got athletes all over the place. They specialize in one sport. If it wasn't for Dan's buddies that are like, Hey, you got to come up and play football. He would never have played. And I probably never would have met him. So it's, yeah, they'll, they'll find you. You just gotta, you know, you mean you look at, Look at um, NFL tight ends. A lot of them don't even are playing basketball in college. Getting drafted, getting drafted out of college basketball. Yeah. Which is crazy. How about Ziggy yeah. Ansa? Ziggy Ansa is a hell of a story, man. Never. They're all, the stories are all over. The, there's countless stories, yeah. and there would be more. It just specialization but they tend, is but again, you, it. like you said. It tends to be guys who are who are well rounded doing multiple yep. sports, doing different things. They're still lifting yep. weights. They're still training and working out, right, and staying in great shape. But in terms of their competition, they're keeping themselves well-rounded and balanced in their competition, different sports, using different aspects of their athleticism. Um, different muscle groups. Yep. It, yeah, it avoids being burned out and, and injuries that happen when you specifically burn out doing the same thing over and over and over again. So. All right, we'll get off our soapbox here, and, and we'll kind of wrap things up. Tate, the last thing I wanted to ask you, and Brett or Corey could t- chime in if they had any opinion on this, but the last thing I want to just really quick wrap things up with, do you have any um, insight to next season, any se- any team that you think might be hot, any team that people should look out for in the state of Michigan for high school football next year, maybe one of these state championship teams or runner-up teams, or maybe a team that didn't, didn't make it there? Um, I'll just keep it on the west side just because, um, you know, I – I saw the majority of teams from the, the OK conference and their, those divisions. Um, Caledonia is going to be very good. They had, uh, I think, every single one of their skill players was a junior. They're going to lose a couple of, of bigger guys on their line to, to D2 levels, but they're going to return their quarterback. Their running back was a sophomore. Um, all, all three wideouts that contributed are back, so they're going to be probably the favorites in the red. Um Catholic Central, you know, that will always reload. So I'll, I'm very interested to see if they can continue that uh, win streak. Win four uh, straight into... state titles, yeah. Yeah. Um, other than that, I think it's it might be a little open on, on the west side. Um, you know, we saw West Catholic kind of make a, an emergence back into, um, you know, being the program that has been recognized as, as one of the best of the past decade. So I, I like to see if that can continue. Um, 
their running back is is also back, who was probably the best running back in the area all of last year, or all this year, excuse me, and Tim Kalaska. So I'm looking forward to, to seeing him continue to, to put on some dominant performances. Um, and yeah, it's, well, there's always, you know, teams that kind of pop up and, um, you know, outshine and or kind of go over their expectations. So I think those three teams that I mentioned will be, you know, teams to look out for state championship contending teams. But um, yeah, I think uh, those three and, you know, we'll see if any surprises come off of off, outside of that. As Corey and I always talk about, man, high school football, teenagers are unpredictable. I feel like you never know. You never the know. shit out of them. Blitz you the never know. And I think I think there's another aspect Blitz that maybe <laughs> maybe isn't getting talked about so much right now. And obviously, there's a lot of transfer stuff going on in college. I think we're seeing the same thing in high school. And um, even locally, I know this year um, – there was a player from Lowell, wide receiver. He's going to Army, and he ended up transferring to Rockford at just like a week or two before the season started. And he ended up being yeah. a key player for Rockford this year. And it's just when you have movement like that, that's just one example. I know there's hundreds more. Um, it's just it's hard to predict what's going to happen the next year. But obviously, in GR, Grand Rapids Catholic Central will be back. I mean, I think we can all mark that down right now. PW will probably be back. But aside from that, I think there's just so much change that goes on. And your development from a 17-year-old to an 18-year-old, you're growing into a man. I mean, a lot can change physically in one year. So it's hard to predict, which is what makes high school fun. I mean, if we knew who was going to be good every single year, I mean, naturally, you'd want to go play for those teams. But it's High school, high school football is probably one of the more fun things or fun sports to follow, in my opinion. I'm excited to deep dive back into it now that I'm first year out of coaching. Kind of just took it to golf, but I'm going to expand my horizons. <laughs> You're an old man. You I'm gonna 30 ex- year old old fuck. I'm going to expand my horizons to high school football and get around the area and check out some games, especially if we're going to be doing this. Um, and we probably have to do it without Vince because he'll be coaching and swapped. So, which yeah. is why we added a new co-host because it's going to be helpful probably come next fall. <laughs> Fart, get ready to travel the state and watch the Fart ball. Johnson. Maybe we can partner up with Tate in the D zone and get some some more action and coverage there. But uh, yes, that'll, there, that'll be for it. the future. That's yep. that's down the line. Well, all right. It is a bright future indeed, man. As Tate texted when I was texting him about this, uh, he was saying how excited he was just because there's just not a lot of coverage of high school football. So obviously the D zone does a hell of a job every year uh, and has done for, I think, more than a decade now covering high school football. So um, we, we would love to throw our hats into the ring. And obviously we're, we're looking to also talk about any level of college football in the state as well. But uh, we're going to always support the, uh, the high school kids, everything in the state of Michigan, man. Tate. Thanks for joining us, man. Appreciate you uh, coming on, taking some time to be with us here, talk about state championship games. Hopefully we can get you back on sometime soon. Absolutely. Th- thanks for having me on. This was a blast. For sure. Anytime we get a chance to, to talk about football, we're always going to have it. We're always going to yes, look sir. for it. And thanks, Tate. Thank all you, right. sir. And thank Sorry. you, Vince. Thank you, Vince. I try my best, man. Well, all right. Thank you for listening. Hope you enjoyed uh, as, as, we, as we mess around football in the Great Lakes State, GLSF ball, Great Lakes State football, whatever you want to call us. We're here talking about football in the beautiful state of Michigan, and uh, we'll be back next week uh, to talk about uh, some action and uh, hopefully Ferris State moving on, talk probably a little bit about Michigan, Michigan State previewing the Michigan's, uh, Michigan's Big Ten championship game. Uh, we'll probably find out at that point where Michigan State likely will fall with a bowl game, and uh, yeah have some interviews coming up some exciting things going on thanks for listening and we'll be back very soon talking about football in the great lake state go blue go green go blue